Welcome to today's All Karmas Lead to Knowledge. As the saying goes, all roads lead to Rome. It's something akin to this. But I've taken it actually from half a verse of the Bhagavad Gita that says, all karmas in their entirety end in knowledge. Sarvam karma kilam partha jnane parisamarte. Everything ends in knowledge. Well, the mind is the sense organ of knowledge. And we perceive the world and we derive knowledge from it. The levels of knowledge are different in different people because of the differences in their karmas, in their rather experiences. If, if you could add a tweak to that title, all experiences lead to knowledge. Karmas are experiences. If you look around in the society, there are plenty of problems. You ask a young child also, enumerate the problems in society and give you a long list. Everybody understands that life is beset with problems. At the same time, there is something that is impelling us to higher and higher levels of knowledge. It's obvious that knowledge is increasing despite all the problems in life. And that goes for society in its entirety as well as individual lives. Our lives are beset with innumerable cares and worries. And yet, we are progressing. We are every day taking newer and newer steps into what was unknown and making it known. So this is one indication that knowledge is our, you can say, Soulmate, that's a better word. People have various soulmates, but uh, actually it's car car and knowledge that's a soulmate. And in this world, today's world, everybody is busy, 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 busy. There's one mantra that's being repeated by everybody. I have no time. You ask people who have retired from everything, they say, I have no time. The young people, I have no time. So, everybody is so busy and working and working and striving. But at times, most of our efforts end in a kind of a dissipated state. If we get exhausted, we feel lost. We don't know where we are heading. It's like running around in circles. So if we can know how to work, what's the nature of work, it will help us progress even further than the plodding that we are doing, slow and steady. That slow and steady wins the race, yeah, to, a, to an extent only. So we need to speed up our own progress. And how does that do it? By understanding what karma is, what experiences are, categorizing them, harmonizing them, and unleashing their power to do good. The mistake that we all do is we seek pleasure and happiness. That is the first mistake that we do. Yes, pleasure and pain are inevitable, but don't seek it. It's come to you. It's coming free to you. It's not invited, but it comes to you. So why do you seek pleasure and comfort and all? Don't seek. 
So, mankind's you can see goal and orientation should be knowledge. Swami Vivekananda says, pleasures come to an end. The goal of mankind, humankind is knowledge. And this is what makes or constitutes human progress. If that is missing, everything else goes down. So, it is true that our bodies and minds are designed to interact with the world. It is very natural and we interact with the world and we interact with other people and there is always a reaction of pleasure and pain and we always, always avoid pain and go for pleasure. That is a normal reaction of our bodies and minds. It is morbidity to embrace pain and it is equally foolish to pursue pleasure. If this is true for us, I mean it is true for all species. All the species, they avoid pain and seek pleasure. But that is reducing humanity to the level of the ordinary, the brutes. What makes us special? This knowledge, this going towards knowledge makes us special. And to just stick around to just seeking comfort, seeking happiness. What is this? Is this a human spirit? It, it, it is not. It is knowledge that we are going towards and that knowledge sustains us, sustains our struggle, sustains our life. Extract that from your life and your life is not worth living. If you give the person all the pleasures in the world and no knowledge, that person will die and vice versa also. So, that is a predicament. There is a story, it was articulated in many cultures, it is found even in the Greek culture, that there was a man being pursued by a tiger. I mean, it is different in different cultures, some say it is a lion and that lion or the tiger is pursuing a person, that person is trying to escape and he slips from the edge and it was a cliff and he rolls down and a tree kind of stops his momentum. And the tree is a small tree. He grabs his branches and the tree is swaying with his weight. You know, tree is on the cliff face, you know, are very fragile. And he looks up and the tiger looks down at his meal. And the person looks up and he looks down, there is a valley down. The tree is now swaying, going to get uprooted and he is clutching at those branches with all his might. And in that mad rush down, there was a hive there and he managed to break it when he was rolling down. And there were these drops of honey falling on him. And in that maddening moment when everything is almost over, he sticks out his tongue to taste a few drops of honey. He's going to die, damn it. That is most of our lives. We don't see the larger picture. We don't see. We are going in for momentary things. Karma, the knowledge of karma and its dynamics will give us a larger perspective on what the whole thing is. So, everything is painful, is painful, is painful. You know who said it? We, we, we can say it. It's, it's a it is a universal truth. Buddha first articulated sarvam dukkham dukkham. Everything is painful, painful, painful. So, you go for pleasure, then it is converted after a while into pain. So, it is obvious that it is obverse and reverse of the same thing. There is one thing 
that appears as pleasure and that same thing at a different time and place appears as pain. You will never get pleasure without the attendant pain. But one thing is there, it can be said, pain is a great teacher. There is no teacher like pain and misery. Buddha also said, everything is transitory, transitory, transient. Sarvam shanikam shanikam. So both pain and pleasure are just flowing past you. They are transitory. But the collective, you can say, experiences of both pleasure and pain form our character. Our character is nothing but a bundle of experiences of both pleasure and pain. And the greater the pain, the greater is a person's character forged. Oh yes. So this character, what is the character? It is a kind of a mental and moral kind of distinctive qualities of an individual. So these experiences, which are nothing but karma, form our character. So tears and laughter and joy and everything pass before our souls. But before passing, they leave an impress, they leave an impression. Nothing goes without leaving its mark on us. Nothing. You may be alone. There is no one around. But some these guys have come and touched your soul. So we all react differently to different people and different situations and depends on the time and place and circumstances. The same thing might elicit a pleasurable response. For some, it will be a painful response. So I said pleasure and pain, they pass before the soul and they go away. No, they don't leave. They never leave. Karma never leaves you. You are the repository of everything that has come into you. Everything. But we don't remember all of them. They are subconscious. And at times, when they kick themselves up and they come out as trauma and stress and anxiety, etc., etc., etc. These are the underlying factors. They are never dead. You may forget them, but they are there, alive and kicking. No experiences ever die out. Okay. So you can say, if everything is coming in, these are, of course, there is an internal mechanism in the mind itself. They are classified according to their types. It is like Swami Vivekananda uses the word pigeonholing. These things are pigeonholed in specific, you can say, hold. Or in the modern language is, they go into separate folders, all of them. So there is a mechanism that, and, we, and it is said, that dreams, in the dream state, the time when all these memories that have come in are classified, because memory is consolidated while you dream. It keeps you engaged with something and it's doing the housework there, because in the daytime it's too busy taking in things. So this is how things don't get muddled. There is a specific sequence to each and every memory. Oh yes. Now, of course, we won't go into the specifics of this mechanism, but take it like there is a mechanism that holds each category of memories. Now, when we do a simple task, what happens? There is a long train of memories behind it, a simple task also. That means there is a long category of 
recorded experiences down there that are helping you with that small task. It's easy. Initially, you do it with great difficulty and with concentration, with diligence, you kind of master it. And you have the whole sequence there helping you. You're not aware of it. So these, as I said, form character. All these memories, memories, memories. Sometimes they're pleasant memories and sometimes they're vicious memories and sometimes they're happy memories, sometimes they're sad memories, but they're all your memories. How you have taken them in, stored them in and are retrieving them. That's how things work out. So repeated habits form character. Character forms, as we all know, destiny. Your destiny is of your making. So there's a problem. Oh, the God has created this kind of miserable life and miserable world. No, no, no. That's your making. So we can also yeah, say that this karma, this experience is the policeman, the police, I mean, for is the prosecutor. Karma is the judge. Karma is the ju jury. Karma is the jailer. Karma is the punisher. It is it's the one that is vigilant there. Constantly, what you have said, done, thought. So, karma in its widest scope is both conscious and subconscious. So I am speaking, Swami Vivekananda says, I am speaking to you, you are listening to me. This is karma. You are doing karma. So breathing, that's karma. And living, that's karma. Everything we do is karma. Now we are all sitting here. Yeah, that's karma. A good karma. So this karma is the greatest gift a person has. Conscious beings have this tremendous gift. We have been misusing it or as a book, title of a book, the gift unopened. So we have not opened that gift, we have not understood it, we have not employed it. So God is not responsible for our actions. We are. And we try to put, oh, it's all God's will. It's all God's will. No, no, it's your will. You, you, your will is a manifestation of your karma. Like your intelligence and everything, everything is a manifestation of your own karma. Okay. So whatever we do is recorded. It does not go out. But there are so many things, 100 million. Yeah, it, 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 they're there, of course. And why shouldn't they be there? There are tons and tons of them. So even a simple action, they say, Swami Vivekananda explains it. Like if you, if you see the waves on the seashore, they crash with such a loud noise. Each wave is made of millions and millions of smaller waves. And they all coalesce and they come out in a big wave. So similarly, all karmas, whatever we say do, there's a big wave of karma. All small, small individual karmas are categorized and they come out in a huge wave. It saves space also. You know? It's a wonderful mechanism in the mind. People say, oh, my mind, uh, my mind is sad, my mind is bad, and my mind is happy. And they don't even know what the, the capabilities of the mind are. There's tremendous power there. And it's working even without bothering us. So when we do any karma, we are working on the world, on people. And it's obvious that other people work on us. Now, this means that uh, this external world will always be there. I mean, uh, until and unless uh, something disastrous doesn't take place, it's going to be there. 
So, what is the way out of this network? So, karma can liberate you, karma can also bind you. So, the first is what we are is a result of karma right now, whatever we have done all through is practice and practice, repeated practice over and over and over and over again. We have done those things and they have become part of our life. And Swami Vivekananda says the great characters of the world had tremendous power, they had tremendous power of work and they brought their will into this. Now, when you say what is the will? Yeah, the will is nothing but you can say compressed, you can say experiences working on the world. This place out here was not the way it, if you look, look back at the old pictures, it, this Broadway East never looked like this. So, it was a human mind, the karma that worked on this place. This chapel was not the way it was, a human will worked on it and the stronger the will, the stronger the karma repeated actions over and over again has kind of condensed that karma and, and so this is the will of a person and it is the strongest thing that a person can have, a will. Repeated actions have formed character and that character is now imprinting itself on the world, tailoring it, redesigning it, modifying it deforming it at times. So, this karma is the power behind will also. So, there are two aspects of this. One is whatever you do goes out in the world as will or as thought and it will return to you. But that is a bad thing. No? I do something and I forget it and it comes and hits me. No karma can exist without it returning to you. Oh yeah, I always use the, always use the, the illustration of a plastic bag. You throw it out, uncaring, you are not bothered as if this is my father's world yeah, or mother's world, whatever, just throw it out. And we are so careless and then it comes to you, back to you that same plastic bag as microplastic. Now eat it. Now it is in the air, in the water, in the soil, it is everywhere. So you throw it out, come back to you. So whatever you do, whatever karma is released from here through the act of thought or feeling or willing takes a circuit and comes back to you. There is no need for a specific agent called God to do that. That is the power embedded within nature itself and we see it all this. As you sow, so shall you reap. That is a universal truth. It is always there. So, that is why Swami you can say, be careful of what you think because those things are going to come back to you. But in the meantime, as they take a circuit out, it it has a kind of a funny, you can say, quality. It picks up stuff on the way. Now, suppose you have thought of a very compassionate thought and you act on that compassionate thought. Suppose you help somebody cross the road. Now, that thought and that feeling and that action will come back to you. In the meantime, it will pick up all the other compassionate thoughts and karma which are in the psychic realm and it will return to you. You will become more compassionate. If you are a wicked person, you notice you start becoming more and more wicked and you will meet only people who are wicked. Oh, it is my karma, <laughs> that is what you are doing. And if you are compassionate and loving and kind, you will meet such people and you will progressively become better and better and 
at compassion and love and unselfishness. This is the power of karma. It's coming back to you. You have let loose a power and it's slowly increasing in its intensity as it circuits back to you. That's another beautiful, you can say, mechanism of the universe. I don't know why we don't, we don't do all these things, because you don't know. I've done something, nobody has seen it, nobody knows. No, that power there knows. So this Swami Vivekananda says, the entire library of the universe resides in your own mind. Yes, amazing. So when your experiences come in, they stream towards one point, which is called the soul. And as it were, the, that experiences like flint stones being struck against each other, fire is produced. So knowledge exists in the human mind, in the human soul. So everything we do, we strike, strike the soul with its experience and then it comes again, there is another strike. And through that, that is the center, the being, the soul, that the real person. And that real person has the power to draw in the whole universe and send it off in a mighty stream. Yeah, we see we are in the presence of such beautiful things. And people say this world is ugly, this world is beautiful and this all this. What beautiful and earth? That beauty is hiding ugliness. But this is a really amazing design of this universe. So it means one thing that we grumble and complain and weep about this world and about ourselves and about Everything, the governments and this and that and oh. But you don't realize nature is extremely miserly. She is very stingy. She will never keep anything in this universe which has no uses at all. Oh yeah, she will never make two things similar. She will destroy one thing if it is similar. She wants, she is very creative. She designs things differently, different things. It may look similar, go, go closer and you see it's not similar. So there is nothing in this universe that is designed as useless. Nothing is in vain. Everything has its uses. And if this is the case, then all our pleasures and all our experiences, all our pains and all our struggles and all our tears are not in vain. They have a purpose. They have a role in our lives. So this is a vindication of our lives, our life's journey. The Lord is very merciful, you know. He doesn't want to leave us all like doing useless stuff. Nothing is useless in the world. Nothing. Not even, they say not even an atom is useless. Everything has its role, everything. So, whatever experiences that you have had all through your life are not in vain. It has its uses. And that use is to awaken your inner being through knowledge. It is kind of as if it is hitting you, wake, waking you up. And as I said, pain is a greater teacher. It is pain that is the one who first nudges that inner being. Waken up. So these forces you draw, you send out your karma out in the world and it comes back to you. So this is how we operate. We think we are alone, we are individual, we are lonely. Nobody loves us, nobody, nobody bothers us, nobody, nobody even looks at us. Well, if you go to do a good karma, you attract the whole universe to yourself. It's as simple as that. The whole universe, and you reach out to the whole universe. 
So this is the clockwise and the counterclockwise movement of all karma. You may be there in the center, but those two forces are constantly circling outwards and circling inwards. But people also come, uh, grumble and complain. Well, uh, we do not have that power of work of karma that others have. What is the difference? I am doing karma, that other person is doing karma. There is a difference. The other person who does real powerful karma has done it through discipline. Every karma which is done through a discipline becomes powerful. And what is the discipline? Restraint. I want to say something, a kind of a knee jerk reaction, I hold myself in check. And I keep on checking every time I want to do something, I keep on checking myself. And that power keeps on growing. Swami Vivekananda uses the example of a cannonball flying and hitting the wall, and it generates intense heat. Another cannonball flies through the air and goes a long distance and falls down, spent. It does not bring power back to you. So every, at the heart of every karma is what makes the karma powerful, that hits, impacts the world, it is restraint. You build up power in the karma. You slowly discipline yourself. Keep on doing that over and over and over. Practice makes perfect, yes. And then you release that restrained karma out in the world. It will make an impact. So this. Now, as we know, it's always over and over. You're keeping on doing karma, karma, karma. What is the end? That is another problem. Is there an end to it? Suppose I have a bad habit and I am a slave to that bad habit. Is that enslavement forever? No. It can be countered. That is another great secret of karma. Every habit, every even a character and everything can be countered by an opposing action. It is like um, Holy Mother says, where you are supposed to get a wound as wide as a plowshare, you get a pinprick if you keep on doing japa. So one karma counters another karma. That is another secret that we have not been using. So one karma can counter another karma and destroy it. Yes, actually destroy it or disable it or whatever. So, if we do something and then we want to change our habits, and we have seen we want to change our habits, we can. After a while, you can we have overcome that habit. That is the power of karma. So, there is no absolute bondage that you are not held in the thaldrum of karma and you cannot get out of it. You can. This is another. Otherwise, if this was not there, the teachings of Vedanta teaches liberation will become useless. If I am always caught up in things which I have done and I cannot extract myself from there, it is it, irrelevant. All the scriptures are irrelevant. Oh, God's grace will come. Yeah, that is for some other time. Right now, you got to exist. So, we have to take responsibility for our actions. We have got to know how to work and how to reach out to the world positively. Do not let things out which are negative. So, negative thoughts can be countered by positive thoughts. So, over and, and I do not want to give a long host of explanations of this. So, this power is the power of karma, this is the power of the universe. You have this power of the universe within you, and we need to employ it. Now, speaking about karma, I say you are the center as it were. And it is true that knowledge is within us. First, knowledge is a great purifier. It, it 
disables some things which are negative in you. The Bhagavad Gita says, Yathai Dhangshi Samit Dhogni Basma Saatvan, like fire reduces all wood to ashes. So, knowledge reduces all karmas to ashes. It's the greatest purifier. The Jnana Agni, Jnana Agni Dagda Karma. So, this knowledge burns away all the impurities. Everything, but we said that those karmas are indestructible. Sri Ramakrishna gives the example of, you know, a coil of rope that's burnt. The coil of rope retains that form, but a small puff of breeze will blow away all the ashes. So all the old karmas that you've had, you've accumulated all over all, all your lives, lifetimes. We won't go into lifetimes now. We'll keep it for some other day. So all whatever you have done are destroyed by the power of knowledge, power of the soul. It retains that form. That is the reason why you say people, they say to attain enlightenment, one has to confront evil, to know evil and overcome it. But what about that old evil that guy has confronted with? That is burnt to the fire of realization. That is what actually happens. So, all knowledge is inside. And you see, I am just touching just the surface of things. The Bhagavad Gita says that even the rishis were confused as to what is karma, what is non-karma. Kim karma, kima karmeti, kavayopyatramoita. And then the Lord says, That karma I will teach you, telling Arjuna. Tatte karma pravakshami. So these are some of the salient points in what he is being teaching us. So there is a tremendous power there in each and every one of us to make ourselves and make the world a place where we can become free, get liberated. So it is like, as I said, the spider weaves a web and at times gets trapped in it. Yeah, but if the intelligent spider, it knows there are certain pathways in the web that are not sticky and it will move on those lines. So if we know where the safe places to maneuver, we can. Then what happens? The prey gets caught up in that sticky web and that is food for the. So knowing karma will lead us to maneuver this world. We will, then we will say, oh, what a beautiful life this is. This is spiritual life. People say, what is spirituality? Oh, you know, sitting down and meditating and this and that. Yeah. But you don't know, even know, you have neglected that great power that is there within you. You have not employed it. Knowing is one thing, employing it is another thing. So everything, like I said, is a vindication of our lives and everything has helped us to come to this state and it will take us forward towards realization. Only if we know what constitutes that, we can say knowledge. So this knowledge, Vedanta is very clear, knowledge exists only in consciousness. That is why consciousness, the other alternate word for consciousness is knowledge. Sat, that which is existence, that which is consciousness and that which is bliss. All knowledge has to give you joy. If you are not getting joy, there is no knowledge there. So the soul has been trying to kind of rid itself of all this, smothered by this karma and coverings and coverings and coverings. It wants to cut its way through. It can't. So you need to punch. You need to do some karma that will punch its way through and 
hit that soul and awaken it. And if you can do that, then everything is done. So, karma is actually nothing but your greatest friend. It is not the greatest friend only. It is you. When you work out in the world, when you think, when you feel, what, whatever you do, it is you. So, your entire life's experiences are kind of coiled up within you. And they need, the good ones need to come out and the bad ones need to be burnt. And that is done by the process of awakening. So, this is a greatest purifier, this knowledge. Where is this knowledge? Yeah, if you are happy, then you know, then you can say, yeah, this guy is, there is something going on within. The person has. The, so, Swami Vivekananda, very, you must know the secret of work, how not to fritter away your energies, how to employ all what you think and do and feel in a very, very guarded way. After, after a while, it becomes natural. You don't worry. Yeah. Like if, you're, if a child is climbing the stairs, you know, the child will hold on to the banister and slowly you know, pull itself up. You know. It's very careful. But after a while, it does not need to hold on to the banister. It can walk up without any. So similarly, actions also will become like this. And whatever now we feel, we experience, we do, we are doing, we will be doing it through knowledge. We will speak through knowledge, we will live through knowledge, we will work through knowledge, we will feel through knowledge. Our entire life will be suffused with that knowledge. And this knowledge, as I said, it is within me. So, the Bhagavad Gita, as I said, there is nothing indeed that is more purifying than this. This is the goal of human being. If we can pin it down in our own minds. It is the knowledge that leads us to greater and greater knowledge. So, all old bondages can be overcome by new karma, new habits. You can form a new character. Never say a person is doomed. There is no doom for anybody. That person has stumbled more. You can help that person. Even if you, are, if you cannot physically go and help the person or do any counseling or it does not matter. Just send through true thoughts. You know, Buddha, when he was uh, living, he used to send a powerful current of thoughts to the east and the west and north and south, above and below. And he said the whole universe was full of his love. Let all beings be happy. May all beings be peaceful. May all beings be blissful. When such thoughts come from such persons, they have a tremendous impact on our minds and our lives. So, as you keep on manifesting that knowledge through that karma, you will be a positive influence on people's life. That is, oh, my knowledge is mine. <laughs> I am not going to share it. No, no knowledge is ever selfish. No knowledge is ever selfish. You have copyrights and all this, but then real knowledge is not copyrighted. It is free. So, you keep on spreading that knowledge through your karma now. Your karma now has become completely transformed. Instead of it being a bondage, it is liberating. And as the Sanskrit saying goes, Muktascha Anyan Vimocha, the free should liberate the others. And that is what it is. Slowly, if you can understand, you are pulling away at your own the layers that you had kind of, the old fossilized layers, those things which were alive. All, like a, all karmas that you have done are alive and kicking inside in the subconscious mind. It is there. And the only way to disable them is through knowledge, counter habits, unselfishness and restraint. This will make you into a power. This will lead you to greater and greater and greater.
he will say, oh, oh, that is enlightenment, enlightenment, oh, they run after enlightenment. Enlightenment starts way back, decades back, maybe lifetimes back. It's not a single event at a point in time. No, it's never done like that. It's a gradual momentum that's getting more stronger and stronger and stronger and then comes the day when everything falls off. So people want instant, instant enlightenment, sorry. It's not like instant coffee or kind of uh, something fast, fast food. Let's go to the fast food, uh, nothing fast here. Yeah, you can do it fast, but it, it takes decades and decades and decades, slowly working yourself up, working your way up towards it. And as you keep on going, you'll become more happy, you'll make people around you happy and they will, you'll transform this world through your knowledge. This is the goal of life. Like Swami Vivekananda says, it is knowledge that we are going towards, not pleasure. Pleasure and pain pass before the sea with different impresses, impressions. These impressions are memories, these memories are the karma. And this karma hits the soul and awakens it. And that's the greatest thing that, that can ever happen to you. When the soul is awakening, oh my God. Then you say, blessed am I. And blessed is all this misery. And blessed is all this evil that has helped me in this great quest, this great goal of mine. Om, peace, peace, peace.